Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Are you the type who would keep going or stop? It's not easy to stop when you have an addiction. Legalizing cannabis won't stop addiction. It trivializes its consumption. Let's be vigilant. If you need help, visit portage.ca. On June 19th, Toscano, Boris Tekka and GSS presents Tribute to the Kings. MMA superstar Anderson Silva. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. Boxing legend Julio Cesar Chavez. Hector Camacho Jr. Ramon Alvarez. Omar Chavez. Live on pay-per-view June 19th, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. You're watching Rogers TV. Hello and welcome to the Rogers TV COVID-19 show. I'm Carol Merton, and before I welcome our guests to this program, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you. For those of you who watch the program regularly, you know I like to discuss how things are going with us as a community for COVID-19 and where we are and what we're asking of you. So today there is great news. In fact, really, really good news. The provincial stay at home order has been lifted and the number of new cases in co of COVID-19 in Grey Bruce continues to decline. For several days recently, we actually saw zero new cases. The vaccine rollout continues in many locations, including vaccine clinics, pharmacies, healthcare facilities, and in the homes of those who require this service. The public health unit could not have done this without the support of the community, and they need us to keep up the good work. We are eagerly awaiting for step one of the province's roadmap to reopen, however, restrictions continue to apply. Please stay the course by following the three W's advised by the Grey Bruce Health Unit. Wash your hands, watch your distance, wear a mask. This journey has been long and we are all weary. Continuing to remain vigilant will bring us all of us closer to the finish line and the end result of reopening Grey Bruce and Ontario. Let's continue to keep up the effort to make the difference together. Thank you to all of you in the community who are working so hard to keep us safe and to those in the community who continue to follow the, the health unit guidelines to help us all move through this pandemic together. And on that note, I want to welcome and thank my two guests today to the program. I have Simona Freybergova, from the Community Garden Network, and also Barry Randall from Grey Bruce Sustainability Network. And I wanna welcome you both to the program. You've got lots to share. <laughs> so We do. <laughs> yeah, no, I, this, is, this is great. So as we talked before the program, I'm quite happy for you to converse back and forth together, but I, I would like to know, there is an interrelationship between the Sustainability Network and the Community Gardens as well. But I'm wondering if you can each talk a little bit about your roles and your connections, and then maybe we can talk about the Community Gardens first. Barry, if you don't mind that, only because I just planted my garden a week <laughs> ago. <laughs> so I have a keen interest and I'm finally getting the dirt out of my fingernails. So. Simona, do you mind going first and just talking a little bit about yourself and your role, and then we'll pass it to Barry, and then we'll go back and talk about the gardens. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for having us, and uh, thank you for organizing this uh, follow-up um, series. Uh, I'm very thrilled to be interviewed by Rogers TV, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I would love to talk gardens, and I can talk gardens forever. 
but my passion is uh, so first of all um i live in meaford and uh, four years ago i joined uh, great brew sustainability network and as a result of uh a uh, report that has been created for United Way. Uh, there was a recommendation for uh, creating how to reduce uh, food insecurity in the area to create a network that people can um, be supported to create more community gardens and also to connect uh, not only community gardens but also local producers, people impacted by COVID-19 and engaging community members uh, uh, and learning experience together. So the whole thing is to connect with the public during these difficult times and more than ever. So I took this project uh, last year, uh, funded by United Way, and uh, it's a really spread uh, virally, I would say. Um, I am basically currently working on almost six new gardens and uh, supporting other gardens uh, in Grey Bruce uh, counties. It's very exciting to visit gardens, that's my favorite part, and connect with the people that are very passionate about gardening and helping them, supporting them with any needs they need. For example, if they need uh, funding, sharing the best practices with other gardens, um, water supply, compost uh, building, any any basically uh, typical um, activities that community gardens need. Excellent. So we're going to come back to that for sure. Barry, tell us a little bit about yourself and, this, and certainly the Grey Bruce Sustainability Network. Okay, well, thanks, Carol, and it's great to be here with Simona and uh, I'll get back out into the sunshine. I think the sun's coming back today <laughs> and back in the garden, but uh, I'm here at the Harmony Center in Owen Sound and my family uh, relocated here a couple of years ago from Walkerton where for a good number of years uh, I lived and that was kind of the, uh, the operational center of the sustainability network, uh, which started about 13 years ago as a not-for-profit social enterprise. And uh, over those years, you know, we've, in partnership with a, a, a number of funders and corporate supporters, we've had uh, a range of programs that we've rolled out, everything from career programs for schools to uh, regional workshops on uh, energy efficient building and, and gardens. And uh, we've done uh, our career works program where we had students out planting trees and that sort of thing. And uh, we also have a partnership with uh, the state of Michigan in association with local community foundations uh, called Lake Huron Forever. And its mandate is to uh, respond to the reality of climate change in terms of extreme weather events and to encourage and help fund um, on the ground projects to create more resilient landscapes and more um, sustainable um, landscapes in terms of absorbing water and dealing with extreme weather events. So shoreline management and that sort of thing. So that's another project that's on the go. But of course, a lot of these things that we traditionally have done involved outdoor or inside gatherings of people. So, you know, our response to COVID was to develop some of these programs online. So on our YouTube site, you can go and see a number of programs that we've run in the past, Sustainable Living Series, and some of our career works uh, in-person programs have been translated into videos, which are now available for teachers to use and that sort of thing. So, and uh, just from my personal perspective, after a good number of years of being the managing director and on the board for a little bit, but, um, uh, as a project manager, I've uh, stepped back from the managing director role and a, a group of, I would say, younger folks <laughs> have stepped in and uh, Lee Gregg uh, from the Wyarton area is now the chair of the board and he's actively managing a lot of these programs and doing a lot of the work and uh, the board has really stepped up to do some of this um, volunteer programming. Uh, but as uh, Simona says, uh, 
especially in the area of community gardens, uh, this time of year is um, requiring a lot of attention and with support from groups like the United Way and others, the value of getting people out on the land uh, now that the snow is gone and uh, some of the restrictions may be lightened a bit, uh, I look forward to a summer full of outdoor activities, appreciating the role of nature and gardening in terms of uh, human health, especially in the context of COVID. So that's kind of a big picture sweep. Um, we also, I, I want to mention styrofoam densification and uh, permeable paving installations that we're assisting with around the region, something that Owen Sound would, would really, really do well to uh, buy into. And we're continuously making new funding applications and looking for new sponsors to support the organization. So I could go into more detail on all those things, but I think uh, the spirit of gardening is, is where we're at. And for sure, I'm very interested in learning more about the projects that you have. One of the questions I had is, okay, what's next as we move forward? So certainly what you're describing would be really helpful. Simona, I want to ask you, how does the title or term community garden, I mean, you, you think of gardens as being in a community, but community gardens is a specific type of garden, correct? Um, what's, you know, what's the difference between a community garden as a social enterprise initiative and just a whole community planning garden? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think that um, community garden, basically community represents people and garden represents the plants. Doesn't matter what that is. And you can have a community garden uh, you can grow vegetable, you can grow only flowers, or you can create an uh, orchard and create uh, fruit uh, brushes or berries and orchards, whatever you think of it. The whole idea is that people work together. People come to the area and then um, when we had a during the COVID, we were restricted to five people but as an essential service um, we were able to co continue doing so during these difficult times and that brings me a joy because i found that people do need connection to the land they do need connection with each other and uh, I, I found a lot of volunteers get back they they talk to me and they go, uh, I, I have no idea what I would do if I wouldn't have the gardens. They love coming and even if they weed for an hour or two um, and it's uh, not super productive, it doesn't always have to be productive. You don't always have to have a green thumb. It's just the connection to be uh, in the garden. Sometimes people think, oh, if I don't have a green thumb, what can I do in the gardens? And I go, oh, there's uh, so many things. We are building compost, uh, uh, system compartments out of pallets, so drilling, um, putting wood together, a little basic uh, carpentry uh, system. We built uh, vermicomposting, we create, we uh, recycled old uh, bathtub um, and created a wooden supports to it, so uh, any gentleman who is handy or even uh, a uh, female can do it. It's it's fun just to create something new and functional. Um, uh, or sometimes we just put uh, plastic uh, on hoop house that need, we usually take down for the winter time. So that needs to be put up. So there's a lot of maintenance and system that needs to go in before the gardeners can create um, something out of the soil. So um, yeah, wood chips, pile, uh, shoveling things, uh, weeding, watering, um, there is so much stuff. So I would not be able to do it by myself. Uh, we need a team and um, I love working with others and uh, sharing the knowledge and learning from each other. So two questions sort of linking together. Who actually, who actually can plant the garden and then if a person was interested in volunteering but not necessarily wanted the, a garden themselves, how would they volunteer? Who do they connect with? Thank you for asking for that. So um, our volunteers, 
every every community gardens is different. Every model is different. Some some gardens they harvest, they plant uh, vegetable, and they harvest for food bank or for meal programs, and they donate their produce to them. Some gardens uh, they are private uh, lots. Uh, gardeners come and they garden for themselves, and they bring it home, and that's basically how they garden. Uh, some gardens are only or they are mixed. Something yeah. goes to the food bank, something goes to the gardeners. So it very depends on the model. Um, but if you do not garden, you can come. We have a number of volunteers that come uh, to the garden. They don't want to have their own garden, but they just come and they help uh, harvest and produce uh, with the produce uh, for the food bank. So they harvest, uh, they weed, they water, uh, they do any maintenance. Uh, so anybody is welcome that uh, would like to be part of it. Very inclusive uh, space for everyone. So where does the land come for the gardens? Right. Uh, the garden comes um, from a different sources. Uh, it can come from the municipality. It can come from the school boards. It can come from a private property um, or any any other institution uh, possibility. So the the, the ownership uh, can vary depending on the area. So with COVID-19, you mentioned you were limited to the number of people who could work in the garden at any particular time. How did you handle that? I mean, did you have people standing at the garden entrance saying, okay, my turn, my turn, I'm sure. I mean, we know how important it's been for mental health for people to be out and about. So did you have a schedule? Did people book a time? How did you work it? Yeah, so what we did, we sent email, we communicate by email uh, to our volunteers here in MIFOR, for example, and we sent email with cover restrictions and waiver and notification how community gardens will proceed. And uh, we basically mentioned that five people are allowed. So if we uh, come to the gardens and there is five people and there are more people coming, we would uh, communicate and uh, I would step out or somebody else would say, I've been here for half an hour, let's uh, allow to somebody else. So we would just um, work together on communication uh, on, on that particular day if that happened. But uh, mo mostly we had a schedule so people could uh, come um, on different times. Do you anticipate in the future that the community gardens and that initiative will grow. Many times we're hearing people saying COVID-19 for all that it's been so challenging, there's been bits of silver lining um, to it. And the appreciation for nature certainly is a silver lining, I think, for people who didn't perhaps understand the importance. Do you anticipate community gardens as a growing initiative? 100%. I don't mean that in a pun way. <laughs> no. Uh, hundred, that was good. If, if not 100%, then I would say 200%. Absolutely. <laughs> you, cannot be, you cannot be food secured if you don't grow your own food. So we are basically uh, teaching people um, how to grow food. I have a, a garden kids club uh, here in Meaford where I am trying to connect uh, the kids with the nature and the food that they can grow and there is abundance and they can always come and snack whenever they wish. So uh, seeing uh, the impact of COVID-19, seeing the increase of the mental health issues that people are having, the nature is basically, why would you not feel um, inspired to get better, grow your own medicine in the gardens yeah. and um, recharge your energy from the, from the soil to get dirty. Remember when you were a kid, when you were helping your parents and just bring those memories, the smell of um, chives and smell of mint and just get into those moments, sit and feel the sun outside and just recharge. That's all I am uh, trying to empower people just to do that. So 
there is absolutely, absolutely a need for community gardens, uh, growing food, uh, improving the carbon sequestration and more and more benefits that you can imagine. I'm already excited I have to get more space to plant more. Barry, I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the Grey Bruce Sustainability Network and who belongs to it and how can people become involved who may have an interest in this? Thanks, Carol. And that's a great question because um, certainly in this in the last couple of years in COVID, things have changed a little bit in terms of how we engage with people. Typically over the first, I would say, 10 years or so, we were kind of um, locally based. We had a regional mandate, um, but most of the work we did involved traveling around and doing workshops in different parts of, of Grey Bruce. And with COVID, what it's forced us to do is <clears throat> go online. And the silver lining of that is, of course, if we're doing an event that anybody in Grey Bruce or around the world for that matter could attend, uh, we're saving a lot of greenhouse gases. People don't have to travel and that sort of thing. So um, I think the the strength that we're offering now in, is to uh, engage people in on-the-ground projects. Uh, as I say, those are slow right now, but the community garden uh, project is just an example of them coming together again. But as we continue to gather online, um, you know, we, we've aligned with the climate action groups. That's in the last couple of years, that's kind of been our evolution, if you will, in that mm -hmm. uh, as a result of a film that was shown a couple of years ago, the Resilience film by John Anderson and Liz Zetlin, uh, that engaged a lot of people regionally in the issue of climate, uh, climate action. And I think after a good number of years of being a sustainability network, you know, we've kind of evolved into aligning with that theme. So with the help of some local volunteers and Lee Gregg and a number of others, we've, we've created a new website and uh, a new, really a new kind of mailing list that um, people can get involved with, uh, which aligns with sustainability. Um, but it's the graybruceclimateaction.ca and uh, there's a newsletter associated with those groups. And really as we evolve, um, a lot of the work that we're doing really falls under the climate action umbrella. So rather than go in two different directions of sustainability and climate change, we're, we're coming together. So um, people can go on that website and, uh, and sign up and there's a list of groups there and that sort of thing. So uh, that's one way to get involved. Our, our website as well, the GB Susnet website, um, I believe we'll give you a chance to sign up, but um, you know we're also present on Facebook. People want to connect with us that way. And uh, again, our mandate is mainly local, so hopefully there are people on the ground in the in the communities. If nobody, if you're not interested in being online, then you can connect with people in the communities and that sort of thing. But as we move forward, I think that's an area you know in terms of our networking function, that mm -hmm. is something that we're really going to ramp up. Um, when online communication has had so much impact on the area. In the information you sent me, Barry, at the very, you talked about the new normal. And um, Simona, this may also fit with your initiative around community gardens, but we have discovered that it is the most vulnerable who are most impacted by COVID-19. Did you want to speak a little bit more about that and how the initiatives of community gardens can address, as well as sustainability, for sure, can address the vulnerable in our community? Sure, no problem. Um, yeah, I think that um, I will be maybe repeating myself, but connecting with each other and connecting with the nature is something that uh, we probably lost over the years. And the vulnerability comes from the food insecurity. So it's me, um, where I live, I feel like Mifred is a very uh, generous um, and I would say rich uh, place or great county overall, where we have abundance of farmers and apple 
orchards and there is so much food that uh, is being shared so one of the things that i am i'd like to mention is that uh, mm -hmm. thing, but i am trying to uh, work with uh, local farmers who have uh, surpluses of seedling seeds but also produce that they would like to donate um, they only don't have the capacity to um, have a manpower to deal with it and distribute food when it's extra so that's where i come in place and uh, it's this network uh, community network it's only me uh, so far with my volunteer I think that this is a huge potential to grow because mm -hmm. every community, if they would have a person similar to me, and I'm calling out that if somebody is interested uh, for Community Gardens Network joining me, I am with open arms uh, welcoming people to join us because I see that uh, the community gardens, the farmers, the meal programs and food banks can work together and actually uh, have the food accessible uh, for vulnerable people in our communities. Um, uh, the other thing I was going to talk about is to not to be afraid to be outside and just sit in the gardens. And as I said, uh, there doesn't have to be a, a huge production, but the 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 recharge of the soul is sometimes uh, more than the food that we can get from the nature so yeah i think that uh, that's a very good point and uh, i would encourage everyone to go to the gardens and uh, try to find in their local area community gardens and just check it out and get familiar whether they there would be a place for them and uh, find few minutes of the day to go outside and recharge i feel it really works for me we almost need a community gardens app where people can just pull up wherever they're visiting to go and actually take a look at, at where the community gardens, because as you say, they're all very different. Barry, how do you decide on your next projects? You mentioned a couple that you're looking at. One was the styrofoam, uh, compacted styrofoam, and you mentioned about paving as well. How does the network come to those? Well, you know, those two projects, uh, uh, the densif styrofoam densifier is initiated in Walkerton. Okay. And now every Bruce County mu municipality and town of Blue Mountains has just jumped on board. They are a collection depot for styrofoam, and there's a, a mobile styrofoam densifier program that's coming around and densifying it into marketable ingots of styrofoam. Yeah. So we're promoting that program. And... Um, through our website or, or direct contact, people can get or Google it, you'll come up with it. Yeah. Um, you know, and the other, the, the permeable paving idea is connects with the idea of all the water that lands on pavement runs into pipes that goes into the river. And if we get too much water, it floods. So if we have permeable pavement, that's equally strong and flexible, water goes through and it reduces the flood risk. So those are two very specific projects. Um, our real next, our challenge as we come out of COVID slowly is to continue with videos and working with people like yourself on developing these programs that everybody can see even post COVID. So that's one of the, one of the silver linings that we've developed our technology to develop these videos. And thanks very much for carrying on your work well, I want to thank you both. The time has just flown by for me, and I'm extending an invitation to return. Um, we do take a summer hiatus a little bit later on, so, but please, uh, we'd be delighted to have you back, and thank you. Thank you to our viewing audience for joining us today. Please join us again to learn more about programs, resources, and services available to you and to your family. Take care. Stay safe care for each other. Thank you.